Hello, Paul. Tonight, we're going over Chapter 9 of Atomic Habits. Uh, this, this title is The Role of Family and Friends in Shaping Your Habits. Um, as always, any questions, comments, thoughts you have, any, anything that stood out to you while you were reading, any connections you have, feel free to jump in either um, live or, or in the chat. Um, like I used to tell my students, like these only go as good as the, the students or the participants. So if it's just me explaining, it's never very good. So make sure you, you jump in if you can. Um, let's see, last week, let's see, we, we talked about how to make a habit irresistible. Uh, I think the main, the main kind of takeaway was the temptation bundling, at least for me, where you attach something you want to do to something you have to do. For example, um, so say you're working out and you don't have time to, to listen to a podcast or maybe you're doing an audio book, maybe you're listening to Atomic Habits, and then you could actually attach, you could listen to the audio book while you were running. So you're attaching something you want to do with something that you, that you have to do. And I think that's really effective. Um, the way I look at it, it could even be like, like if you wanted to check social media or, or something, maybe you attach that to, you don't, you don't get to do that in, unless you've listed X amount or you give yourself a few minutes after you've done your photography. Like it's kind of, it's kind of like you can't have your dessert the way I look at it until, you know, until you eat your broccoli. Um, so, so, so make sure you're eating the broccoli. Did anyone last week try to incorporate any of that temptation bundling or anything from last week that maybe you incorporated or had time to think about? Dana? Hi. Well, um, <laughs> I'm not sure this is the right way to start it, but uh, I kind of failed and learn some things in the process for last week. I uh, wanted to implement the <clears throat> making a new habit appealing and rewarding myself with, uh, with the game with the marbles, right? Well, needless to say, a lot of stuff happened, mostly positive, and I got distracted and I didn't do it. You know, it, what stopped me was the fact that I did not want to spend the extra time to figure out the hustle of uh, finding the marbles or a replacement object like paper clips or something. So that's what stopped me. And uh, yesterday I was uh, in a 24 hour room and I was talking to Christine and Michelle and Mimi and everybody else. And we came up with the, actually Michelle solved my problem. She was like, well, if you don't have those stuff, here's a list of affirmations. So I printed those out. I cut them up in front of everybody and put them in my jar so I can uh, use those instead of the problem that actually stopped me. It's such a stupid small thing for the whole week. I like that. Um, so I mean, we've talked about environments. So it's almost like the environment, the marbles. There's too much friction there. So the group, in this case, you know, the people in this group were able to help you figure out a way to work around that and, and do it a different way. And so once you made that switch, has it been working? Yep. And the idea, the reason I brought this up was because the book mentioned, you say you're going to do something, but if you're not specific about it, mm. it's probably not going to happen. And I was not very specific about it. All I said is, yeah, I'm going to do the marbles. I'm going to try it. I didn't say when. I didn't say how. And I for sure didn't have a place in my mind where I knew where the marbles would be, not that I had any for that matter. Yeah, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's interesting. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's the quote I, like I, well, you can't say I've got that fake background, but I've got my daily calendar that I post with my listings. It's from the book, You Are a Badass. <clears throat> and today's, today's quote deals with kind of what you're talking about. It says, specifics allow the universe to fulfill your order. Um, it's kind of long, so I won't read the whole thing, but it's talking about like, if you ordered a sandwich, you wouldn't just say, Hey, I, I just want a sandwich. You'd be very specific. You'd want roast beef, mayo, no mustard, pickle, lettuce, tomato on a row, please. Uh, um, so talking about that specificity, 
And the last, the, la the, the last of that quote says, the universe needs details too. It will respond, it always responds. But if you just focus on how awesome it would be to make more money, you may receive 10 bucks instead of the tens of thousands that would make a significant change in your life. Uh, so that just, that's interesting. That ties into exactly what you're talking about. And like all of these books and these quotes, like they all go back to Think and Grow, Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill, which I think is a book we, we need to get to that was written in the early 1900s and that's one of the big the big concepts from that book and one of the things he does is he guides you through writing out a very very specific uh not a mantra but uh, like an affirmation not even an affirmation it's kind of like your goal but it's very specific and it also tells specifically like what you're going to do what you're going to give up what you're going to sacrifice to make that happen and um I don't know. I'm on. I'm on a little tangent there, <laughs> but anyway. So, so you were saying you you were that specificity really helped, right? Yep. Yeah. And I came to realize one huge mistake that I made while going over this book and learning all these, uh, you know, small details and all these formulas for self help and creating rituals and habits. And I realized that at the end of the day, I, I was very vain, super vain in thinking that because I achieved a goal one time, it should somehow be way easier for me to achieve it again than it would be for anybody else starting today. It dawned on me that, you know, just because you did something one time, it means nothing. Most of the goals that we actually care about are goals that have to be done on a daily basis and they do not come easy because if they did, everybody would have them and they would not be so special and we wouldn't want them so much. Yeah, I, I think it makes me think of uh, Jason Garrett. He used to be the Cowboys coach and used to be the Giants coach. Not, not the greatest coach, but he, he had this saying about it being the process. You know, I, I don't think goals... A goal is just a direction, right? It's it's the habits, which is what this book is talking about, or the processes that you do consistently that are more important that will actually get you where you want to be. And I think that's what we need to. Um, I mean, yeah, you want to you want a goal, but without the habit and the process and the routine, it's just a dream. You know, it's just a wish. Everybody has wishes, but. And that's what I like about this book. And um, and this chapter is talking about how people can support us, kind of like what you were talking about, Dana, with Christine, and I forgot who else you, you mentioned um, that was helping you, that who we surround ourselves with has um, can have a massive impact on our success or, or our failure. And I do appreciate you sharing that. Um, so we'll look forward to hearing back next week. Um, hopefully, hopefully that habit, because, you know, in, in the one thing by Gary Keller, he talks a lot about how long it takes, like they've studied habits and the average is 66 days to form a habit. It can be longer up to like six months, uh, the more complex the habit is. So even if we're talking about like a listing habit, um, that's probably fairly complex because there are a lot of things that can get in the way of, you know, creating that, that listing habit. So it may be longer than 66 days, but I would say at the minimum, you know, a little bit over two months to get that habit down. But the more you do it, like, like with tech, um, you know, it's just pr probably part of who he is. Um, and I know I've, been in this group a little bit over a year and I don't listen nearly as much. And I've only recently started doing seven days a week, but <clears throat> it would feel weird if I didn't list, especially during the week at this point. All right, let's go ahead and get into this chapter. Um, at the beginning, I found this interesting. Hey, uh, uh, hey, hey, hey Brian, can I, can I say something before you start on this next chapter? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've been coming to your book call for the past few weeks, and I've been hearing you talk about these chapters. Um, what's the name of the, the, this book that you, you're recommending to read? The, the one we're reading right now? Yes, sir. 
Yeah, that's Atomic Atomic Habits. Atomic uh, Habits. Yeah, and the author is James Clear. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, it's to me, it's probably it's one of, if not the the best books you could read. All right. Well, I'm going to read that book 100. percent And I, I'm gonna get back to you next week and let you know what I think about it. Sounds good. Can't wait to hear. All right. All right. Um, so, the, so the beginning of this chapter, it starts with a Hungarian man in 1965, and I probably mispronounced his name, but Laszlo Hogar. It's kind of it's kind of out there to me. Like he he starts writing this woman named Clara, and he has this belief that it's not your um, innate ability or intelligence that that's that's important. It's um, it's he's a believer in the in the value of hard work that really determines success, and he message he messages um, he messages he he writes he writes to Clara, who was a teacher. She also had similar views, not quite as strong as his, but similar views, and he wanted to do this experiment, which seems kind of wild. So they basically got married. And he wanted to test his hypothesis um, that hard work is what made you successful. And so they decided to have children and they and on the top of 114, he said their lives would be dedicated to chess. Um, so they courted, they got married and they had three girls, Susan, Sophia <clears throat> and Judah. Susan was the oldest. Uh, she began playing chess when she was four years old. Within six months, she was defeating adults. Sophia, the middle child, I'm on page 114, um, did not did even better. By 14, she was a world champion, and a few years later, she became a grandmaster. I mean, that's pretty good. And then Judith, the youngest, was the best of all. By age five, she could beat her father. At 12, she was the youngest player ever listed among the top 100 chess players in the world. At 15 years and four months old, she became the youngest grandmaster of all time, younger than Bobby Fischer, the previous record holder. For 27 years, she was the number one ranked female chess player in the world. So their whole life was centered on chess. They had books about chess. Um, and, you know, through this devotion to that one topic, they created three girls that were excellent at it. And, you know, two of them were grandmasters and Judah was ranked number one for 27 years. So he's, he kind of proved. And, and when I read that, it made me think of, um, you know, we, we make connections as we read. We think of things that we know in our, our personal lives or things we've read or things we've seen. It made me think of Tiger Woods, like when Tiger Woods was a baby, basically his father, you know, got him into golf. And, you know, we've heard of other athletes and um, that have done this. And it's, it's kind of interesting that through, you know, through that environment, he, he shaped them. And he ended that, this section, the last paragraph, he said the Polgar sisters grew up in a culture that prioritized chess above all else, praised them for it, rewarded them for it. In their world, an obsession with chess was normal. And as we are about to see, whatever habits are normal in your culture are among the most attractive behaviors you'll, you'll find. And obviously, we're, we're in a this group focused on eBay. And I mean, I, I, you can't help but you know, kind of holding the group up to this chapter, or at least I did, like, because this is a group that I think has a lot of influence on, on, on our um, eBay lives and, and business lives. All right. Um, the, the next section is subtitled The Seductive Pool of Social Norms. And it, it kind of goes, you know, through the evolutionary, um, brief history of, of humans and like 
he quotes Charles Darwin on the second full paragraph. He says, Darwin noted in the long history of humankind, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. As a result, one of the deepest human desires is to belong, and the ancient preference exerts a powerful influence on our modern behavior. So, like basically, you know, we're we're social animals for the most part, and we we seek to fit in because if you go back 10, 10,000 plus years ago your survival you're not going to make it on your own no matter how badass of a hunter or or whatnot like you you needed there's there's safety in numbers and um so that you know we talked about this last week i i, I even think where we talked about the birds and, and pecking their, their mother's beak and how they would even peck like a, a red circle on the ball because it's like they're genetically pre-wired probably passed down from countless generations and so I, I think we are the same way as far as um social social that social element now obviously some some are introverted and you know the whole lone wolf mentality but overall um that that desire to fit in and to belong is very strong and he, he talks about how these norms can even be invisible to us. Like if you think about it sociologically, you have your family where we pick up a lot of things from our family we're not even aware of. And then when you go into education, go into school, you know, friends become important and teachers and coaches can ha have an impact. Um, and then later as you go in, in, into to different careers and whatnot, then, then that can also have an impact. He says on page 116, we imitate the habits of three groups in particular. And, that, and that's what the rest of this chapter is about. He, he calls them the close, the many, and the powerful. <clears throat> and he says each group offers an opportunity to leverage the second law of behavior change and make our habits more attractive. So we're still under that big umbrella of making habits more attractive, which means it's more likely that you're going to um, to be able to do the habit and create the habit by making it more attractive. And, and as we've talked previously, the opposite, the inverse of that is to try to stop a bad habit. You know, you want to make it unattractive and you can do that through um, environment manipulation. That's all when Dana was talking about the marbles, it sounded like her environment wasn't conducive for that habit to take place because of, of it could be just the friction, something as simple as not having the marbles there. And we, you know, we've talked about um, we've, we've talked about the example of, you know, if you're if you're an everything seller and you have to set up different different photography setups, that 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 can be enough to stop you from from listing. And I think the more you niche down, you know, you that habit it, it becomes more unattractive to list other things. I mean, Chris is talking talking about this while he's trying to get through his hundred, um, his one, 100, what, what does he call it? The, the random items he's trying to list and he's running out of steam. All right, the first one is imitating the close. And this is talking about proximity. He says proximity has a powerful effect on our behavior. This is true of the physical environment as we discussed in chapter six, but it's also true of the social environment. We pick up habits from people around us. <clears throat> we copy the way our parents handle arguments, the way our peers flirt with one another, the way our coworkers get results. When your friends smoke pot, you give it a try too. When your wife has a habit of double checking the door is locked before going to bed, you pick it up as well. I find that I often imitate the behavior of those around me without realizing it. In conversation, I'll automatically assume the body posture of the other person. In college, I began to talk like my roommates. When traveling to other countries, I unconsciously imitate the local accent despite reminding myself to stop. As a general rule, the closer we are to someone, the more likely we are to imitate some of their habits. I'm probably just going to read this page because I've got so many annotations on it. It's probably just better to go straight from um, James Clear. One groundbreaking study tracked 12,000 people for 32 years and found that a person's chances of becoming obese 
increased by 57% if he or she had a friend who became obese. It works the other way too. Another study found that if one person relationship lost weight, the other partner would also slim down about one third of the time. Our friends and family provide a sort of invisible peer pressure that pulls us in their direction. And, and I can say like, because I taught eighth grade for years and that's, that's probably the, the peak seventh and eighth grade from what I've seen, it's probably the peak of peer pressure. And, you know, students will go along with what their friends are doing um, because that, that desire to fit in is so strong, that peer pressure. Of course, peer pressure is bad only if you're surrounded by bad influences. When astronaut Mac Massimo was a graduate student at MIT, he took a small robotics class. Of the 10 people in the class, four became astronauts. Wow. If your goal was to make it into space, then that room was about the best culture you could ask for. Similarly, one study found that the higher your best friend's IQ at age 11 or 12, the higher your IQ would be at age 15, even after controlling for natural levels of intelligence. We soak up the qualities and practices of those around us. And like when I read that, it made me think about, you know, tech in this group. Um, you know, being surrounded, and, and countless people have said this, like this group is, you know, the best thing that could help happen to them as resellers. And beyond the very practical advice that tech and others give, I think it's just the culture of that accountability of, of, of tech setting the example, and then other people, you know, that follow in. Um, one of the most effective things you can do to build better habits is to join a culture where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. That's the listing goal here. New habits seem achievable when you see others doing them every day. If you are surrounded by fit people, you're more likely to consider working out to be a common habit. If you are surrounded by jazz lovers, you're more likely to believe it's reasonable to play jazz every day. Your culture sets your expect expectations for what is normal. Surround yourself with people who have the habits you want to have yourself. You'll rise together. Um, yeah. And then he just kind of goes on a little bit more. No, nothing sustains motivation better than belonging to the tribe. Um, it transforms a personal quest into a shared one. Previously, you were on your own. Your identity was singular. You are a reader. You are a musician. You are an athlete. When you join a book club or a band or a cycling group, your identity becomes linked to those around you. Growth and change is no longer an individual pursuit. We are readers. We are musicians. We are cyclists. The shared identity begins to reinforce your personal identity. And I, I found this was really important. This is why remaining part of a group after achieving a goal is crucial to maintaining your habits. And, and I know <laughs> Tech has said this many times, like, like he's given the secret sauce. So the group's not necessary, but I would, I would disagree with Tech. I would say this group is necessary for that reason um, to maintain the habit. Like, like the culture of this group helps people maintain those habits even if they've achieved them, not to mention a lot of us are not nearly having achieved the habit or, or at least at the level we want to be. So I, I found that, I found that very, very um, enlightening. Does anybody have any thoughts? I'm doing a lot of talking here about that or anything else we have rather talk about. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. The behavior around this part I love because uh, I think that Something that's always intrigued me is you, you, I don't know, I guess I'll just word it the best way that I can. If, if you don't set some type of standard for yourself, those around you will. And I think that that's where like, you know, like what you had said, the group has a way of, of grounding us to what I've always called us a tribe or our own tribe, you know? So I think that, you know, if we don't determine the standard, like that's 240, 250 a day, it's just not a negotiation. That's just the standard. 
And that doesn't move when your environment changes. That doesn't move when your life changes. That doesn't move when uh, you have uh, things come up that challenge that. And I think that that starts to ingrain itself into us as we kind of get that mindset, that non-negotiation mindset. And for some reason, I just, in my morning workouts, uh, that's what comes to my mind is, okay, I've got to set the standard or, and I think we've said it before too, that until your spouse or your family or people see that you're actually making this thing, you're serious about it. It's just a hobby. So I kind of love that behavior around us thing. How important that is. How, how important that is. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. Tom? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would second what, uh, what that gentleman just said. Um, it's almost like if no one sets the tone, then the tone will be set for you. Um, I mean, I'm still new to the group, and I believe about a month in or or so, I almost just checked out of the group because it just there were some things that conversations that got distracting, and but I noticed that uh, uh, that could switch. Tone, so to speak, you know, to keep everybody on, you know, and not get caught up in the little petty things that kind of, kind of distract you. So, yeah, I second what the gentleman just. Yeah, and I think I'm not sure if that's my connection, Tom, or maybe it yours, but seemed like it was kind of kind of laggy there. But I think I got the gist of it. Um, Tom was. Can you hear? Yeah, you're kind of breaking up. There are others. Is he breaking up for y'all too, or is that just? Me? Yeah, sometimes you gotta shut your video off in order for the for that breakup to go away. Yeah, well, I'll stop your video. See if that helps you. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, we hear you now. So you were talking about the tone that, that Tuck and Chris were, were setting. Is that right? All right. I, I think that's what, what Tom was saying. Um, and yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Like if, if, there, if the tone isn't intentionally set, like, like I was a coach for most of the time I was a teacher and that was vital. You know, we, we had to set the, the tone or we called it like the, the team culture right like what was acceptable you know things like hard work teamwork you know all, all these cliches you could throw out but like you have to constantly reinforce that you can't just you, you can't just lay out the rules and the culture and then never address it because you know it, it has to be it has to be constantly reinforced um and i think this group actually does a really good job. I don't think, from my perspective, I, I don't think it's had to have been laid down very often. Um, and of course, tech has no problem doing that or, or Chris when, when it's necessary. But I think the overall, I think we kind of, the way I look at it, like everyone kind of feeds off of tech because if somebody asks a question, it's almost like you've got out hundreds of mini techs responding. <laughs> And some people are almost word for word. Um, and, and that's that kind of culture or, cause it's, it's a culture within the group is what it is that that's set by tech and kind of spread by most people. Anybody else have anything they wanted to share? Let's see the chat. Um, yeah, tech said after episode one, the point of the group is to find discipline. Yeah, and I think the culture of the group um, kind of helps people. And, and I know it for like you and me, like I, 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 I struggle with squirrel brain and, you know, and I know every week tech repeats himself and, you know, for some of us, it takes, some people can hear it one time and they got it and they're good. But a, a lot of us, I think it just takes repeated exposure. And then at a certain point, for whatever reason, it really sinks in and, and you get it. Um, Bo says, vision is the foundation of discipline. Vision chooses, vision chooses your friends, library books, habits, etc. When you have vision, you know exactly what not to do. 
if it does not lead you to your destination. Otherwise, habits are meaningless without vision. Yeah, you, you do have to have the vision or the goal, and then the habits will get you there. Matt says, I love repetition. It's how you become a great, great at guitar. Yeah, or, or really anything, right? So those reps, um, the, the 10,000 hour rule to, to master is what they throw around. And then both of this is why leadership is 80% attitude and 20% skill. That's why you find people with tremendous skills always working for people with the right attitude. Yeah, and I think we use a lot of sports, or at least I do, a lot of sports metaphors because all these concepts, you can see them played out very visually in the sports world. I, I know Tech talks about baseball, and for me, um, basketball and football a little bit more, but it's the fundamentals. Um, I think the, the greatest programs, they, they continue to work on the fundamentals, you know, the, the drop, dribbling, passing, shooting, um, free throws, you know, bend your knees, follow through, flick the wrist, come up on your, your tiptoes, you know, all these, all these things. And, and I think that's the same thing is those repetitions and the fundamentals is, is what, where greatness is really created. I'm sorry, Carla, I didn't see your hand. Carla? I just put it up. Ooh. I just wanted to say that I had a big laugh. Uh, Jared, I think he posted in the group yesterday. He's like, just, Ch just uh, popping in to tell you to keep listing boo hoo <laughs> it just it just kind of like reminded me of kind of the tone of our group where it's like we're all supportive of each other and if somebody's like really going through a hard time we're all like there to help but at the same time it's like we all have life stuff going on and we all have problems and issues aside from you know reselling and you just kind of got to you know, set that aside and just realize that we all have a goal to complete and, you know, no one's gonna, like, it's hard to explain what I mean, but like, no one's gonna feel sorry for you if you come in and post like every day, like I didn't get my work done. Like, it's, it, yeah, <laughs> like, it's just, we're all, we're all there to be supportive, but at the same time, it's like the, the seriousness of the group is also what makes it awesome. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and it's, and I will say it's hard to post when you didn't hit your goal for the day. And that, that takes a lot of, like, I've had to do that a few times, but if you're consistent, if that's the norm, I didn't hit my goal, didn't hit my goal. Like what the heck? Um, and I, I think even going back to what Tom was talking about, re, kind of resetting that culture that I think that's what a lot of that was about is, yeah, there are reasons and we, everybody has issues but it, it, we got to focus on the positive and, and because if, if somebody's not hitting their goals consistently, like we can't go to someone's house and list for them, you know, what, whatever issues, and we all have different issues. You got to try to find a way to work it out. And you're right, Carl, and we can definitely support each other, but ultimately, you know, there's that self accountability that, that we have to, we have to hit the submit button is what it comes down to. All right, good, good, good shot. Um, good conversation. The chat. Angie says people who are who aren't the right fit in the culture will weed themselves out. That's I agree. Um, yeah, Angela, we are discussing atomic habits. We're in chapter nine tonight. Um, I'm gonna summarize. It's kind of talking about the effect culture and people have on us and our habits. Vanessa says the group acts as an accountability partner. I agree. All right, let's move to the um, the sorry, I lost my, my spot. Oh yeah, we're on the, the second one, right? Um, imitating the many, and it starts with a in the. It, it starts this sub this subsection talking about in the 50s, a psychologist named Solomon Ashk conducted a set of experiments. And on page 119, if you see the diagram, it's got um, it's got a rectangle with a line that's a certain length on one box. And on the other box in that same rectangle, you have three different lines that vary in length, but one of them matches up the line in the box on the left and it's 
pretty pretty clear and pretty easy like which one matches up right but he he did this experiment where um where he he had different people here let me see on page 120 uh he he said, Ash ran the experiment many times in many different ways when he, what he discovered was that the, okay. So he had actors that would say that a line that wasn't the right length was the correct. Answer. So they were saying they were, they were given the wrong answer intentionally. And, and what he realized that if it was a, a small percentage of the actors who did that, um, the individual would would disregard it but as the number of people who who would falsely say that the answers were wrong as that number increased most of the participants would agree with them even though they knew it was wrong um he, he said uh, in the middle of page 120 nearly 75 percent of the subjects had agreed with the group answer even though it was obviously incorrect. So basically it's like the peer pressure. So even though you know the answer, three fourths of the people, once enough people disagreed with them, would go along with the incorrect answer. Um, and obviously that kind of implies the power of those that are, that are cl in close proximity to us in that peer pressure. And then it gives, it gives examples. Uh, whenever we are un unsure how to act, we look at the group to guide our behavior. We are constantly scanning our environment and wondering, what is everyone else doing? Uh, and you see this a lot in school too. We check reviews on Amazon or Yelp or TripAdvisor because we want to imitate the best buying, eating, and travel habits. It's usually a smart strategy. There is evidence in numbers, but there can also be a downside. The normal behavior of the tribe often overpowers the desired behavior of the individual. For example, one study found that when a chimpanzee learns an effective way to crack nuts open as a member of one group and then switches to a new group that uses a less effective strategy, it will avoid using the superior nut cracking method just to blend in with the rest of the chim chimps. <laughs> and it made me think about like, we talk a lot in here about the listing the most efficient way to list um and how e even it, it, like i think we've all agreed that text is the most efficient but very few if anyone else in this group actually does it completely like he does and so what what is it made me wonder like is is that somehow into play i i, I don't know um he says humans are similar there is tremendous internal pressure to comply with the norms of the group the reward of being accepted is often greater than the reward of winning an argument, looking smart, or finding truth. Most days, we'd rather be wrong with a crowd than be right for, by ourselves. The human mind knows how to get along with others. It wants to get along with others. This is our natural mode. You can override it. You can choose to ignore the group or to stop caring what other people think, but it takes work. Running against the grain of your culture requires extra effort. When changing your habits means challenging the tribe, change is unattractive. When changing your habits means fitting in with the tribe, change is very attractive. And that, that's kind of the end of that second section, talking about imitating the many. Anybody have any thoughts on that, on that section? All right. The last, um, the last section of the three groups is imitating the powerful, and it, it kind of talks about how we all seek power and prestige and status. We want pins and medallions on our jackets. We want president or partner in our titles. We want to be acknowledged, recognized, and praised. This tendency can seem vain, but overall it's a smart move. Historically, a person with greater power and status has access to more resources, worries less about survival, and proves to be a more attractive mate. We are drawn to behaviors that earn us respect, approval, admiration, and status. 
We want to be the one in the gym who can do muscle ups or the musician who can play the hardest chord progressions or the parent with the most accomplished children because these things separate us from the crowd. Once we fit in, we start looking for ways to stand out. And then obviously to me, like the listing habit comes to mind, right? You know, like, like, like text, they're getting up 250 a day. And I think he said by himself at one time, he got up 160 a day. And I don't, <laughs> I mean that, I, and as far as I know, no one's uh, approached that number. He says, this is one of the reasons we care so much about the habits of highly effective people. We try to copy the behavior of successful people because we desire success ourselves. Many of our daily habits are imitations of people we admire. You replicate the marketing strategy of the most successful firms in your industry. You make a recipe from your favorite baker. You borrow the storytelling strategies of your favorite writer. You mimic the commu communication style of your boss. We imitate people we envy. High status people enjoy the approval, respect, and praise of others. And if that means if a behavior can get us approval, respect, and praise, we find it attractive. We are also motivated to avoid, avoid behaviors that would lower our status. Kind of like what Carlin was saying. If you, I think if you posted every day in the group, didn't get my listings up. If you did that consistently, I, I think your status would be lowered in the group. We trim our hedges and mow our lawns because we don't want to be the slob of the neighborhood. Like that's really interesting. I remember in college reading Walt Whitman, um, and, you know, on Walden's Pond, and um, I don't know. Like, like there, if you contrast that to this whole idea of lawns, and I know Tech has a lawn care service, but it's kind of really crazy if you really think about it. the money and resources we spend to have a certain grass at a certain level and a certain, like we're trying to control and manipulate nature and we're spending thousands of dollars. Um, but, and then what's the real reason? We don't even think about it. That's an example of the culture. I don't think most people even think about it. It's just, it's just what you do, but really why, why are we spending so much time and effort on, on, online? It's really, I mean, I know you got homeowners associations and they're, maintaining the culture of that group but really there's there's really not not a really practical reason behind it i, I think that's really interesting when our Is mother there, comes, like a pest prevention thing um i mean if you've got fire ants or something i mean yeah you you, you could treat that but i'm i got i've been guilty like you know we had uh true green which i i got rid of but spent over a thousand dollars a year to just have a nice green lawn that you know that looked good but what's the purpose behind it? i think it's it's to fit in right i mean I, what 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 pest in your lawn would, could really harm you i mean i know fire ants here in texas but you do not want to you don't want those I bet, I bet tech could give us some ideas of the pests that would come out. I know that we've heard in our area that people get really upset because it's mice and field mice and squirrels and you know unwanted critters, unwanted in your neighborhood and in your in your house. Right. Yeah, and and I think that that and that's a good point. It, but I think that's even a little different. Like when I think about lawns, I don't think as much about the pests. And you're right, that's absolutely a part of it. But I think most of us probably spend it just having a nice green lawn that's trimmed and. You know, all the, the the trimmings are, you know, bagged up and trashed. Um, Dana? Oops, I didn't realize that I had my hand up. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. But even text comment, he says, clean lawns for your house and your neighborhood increase property value. I agree with that, but why does that increase? It, that's just, I think that's a cultural that's cultural value that we share, but I'm just, I'm just asking what's behind it. There's really no, I mean, just because it looks good is, is really the answer. And we've, we've decided that that looks good. <laughs> Carla says that's why she lives in the apartment. Yeah. I mean, on a practical, yeah, but, but what is shitty is, you know, that's, 
that's an opinion, really. I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with what Tech's saying. It does affect your property value, but I'm just saying beneath that. And by the way, I keep I, I keep my law. It's not doesn't look bad, but I'm just I like to think about and I like to think about these things. Like, what is behind that? Well, why? Why did we decide as a culture and a society? I'm I'm, I'm sure it's billions of dollars, at least hundreds of millions, if not billions, that are spent on lawns in the United States. But, but also, wouldn't that be, so Tech and Chris have set some standards, or what I would say standards, of like the 10, 10 listings per hour or 30 in a day and those things, they were set by someone and we're all going, we're going with it because that's a part of our culture and what we want. And I think that's the same thing, kind of like the HOAs or, and it's a pride thing. It's a pride thing of saying, you know what? Hey, I did that today and look at my neighbors did it. And we're in this part of this group together. So I think they could just become, it's, it is cultural to get back to the foundation of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I would just say, I'm just point devil's advocate here mostly, but like, like 10 listings per hour, like, like that's very, very practical because that, how many widgets per hour you can produce is going to equal money, but, but your lawn. And I mean, yeah, what tech says about property value, but it's not like necessarily having a, a green lawn that's, that's well kept. It doesn't really do anything. It's just, but it's because as a society, we've decided that that is what looks attractive, which is just kind of the point he's making is the, it's, that's the power of, of, of culture and peer pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, see a lot of people <laughs> are, Angie says, yep, curb a kill, uphill. But can't you say like, to me, when I go hiking in nature, there's no mo there's no mowed lawns. It's wild and it's beautiful. So why is it that a lawn has to be controlled by man? So they're beautiful like like you could even argue that conception it's just what we've decided for whatever reason to me it's like almost like a psychological element like you're trying to control it but like i'd put me in the forest in colorado with wildflowers and trees and no lawnmowers inside and I, i'd take that any day um dana says i think it's a simple way of showing that the people who live in this neighborhood are willing to compromise that they care i know but that that and I'm playing devil's advocate here, but they care. But why does keeping a lawn show you that you really care? <laughs> Tech says, if you want to go down the conspiracy trail of culture and peer pressure, San Augustine grass is owned and only four growers have the license. Yeah, and, and like San Augustine, like I used to have, I love it personally. I love walking on it barefoot. Um, it feels great. Um, but that takes a lot more water than other types of grass. So if we're talking from a practical standpoint, point of view would almost and i know there's some that that do the artificial turf now because you don't have to mow it and weed eat it and water it and it's more efficient um sam says i have no lawn dug it out and planted a massive veggie garden people think see i love that sam like like i like that yeah marketing yeah and, and i think just the point is it, it's an example one example of many of and we don't even think, I don't think most of us think about it. And, and I, I see people defending it, but like, have we, have we really thought about why there is this peer pressure there? That, that, that's all. Um, okay, so the chapter summary, and then we'll take thoughts from anybody on this chapter. I like how he summarizes it. The culture we live in determines which behaviors are attractive to us, like the, the mown lawn versus a veggie garden. I think I'd rather have the veggie garden. I love like garden tomatoes. It's so good. We tend to adopt habits that are praised and approved of by our culture because we have a strong desire to fit in and belong to the tribe. We tend to imitate the habits of three social groups, the close, which is family and friends, the many, your tribe, and the powerful, those with status and prestige. One of the most effective things you can do to build better habits is to join a culture where one, your desired behavior is the normal behavior. And two, you already have something in common with the group, which that, this is our group, obviously. The normal behavior of the tribe often overpowers the, the desired behavior of the individual. Most days we'd rather be wrong with the crowd than be right by ourselves. If a behavior can get us approval, respect and praise, we find it attractive. 
So um, anybody got any thoughts on, on this chapter? It's kind of like, I think it's on a macro level, it's kind of talking about how different groups and people can uh, influence us. Dana, is, your, is that a new hand raise or are you still up? Yeah, it's a new one. Well, I don't know. I, I feel like I've been on a journey since we started this book. The more we go into it, the more I learn, <laughs> it's so funny because I realize that unless we do something forever, it doesn't count. No team is special until they win and they have a good streak. That's what makes them memorable. It seems to me like success and habits are here to help you do one thing. Do what you want to achieve the longest time possible. Like if it's not something you're willing to do forever, it almost doesn't even count as success. And I feel like our group, the reason it helps, even though you already have the information and the technical aspect all down, the group helps you if you ever would to stray away. to so remind you that there is a path and other people are walking on it. So it's achievable, it's doable. And, you know, that's, that's just what I've learned. <laughs> I've learned that it has to be forever. It doesn't count. Yeah, and, and I would even argue... And it's not going to be easy. Yeah, you, yeah, without the habits, I don't even think you can achieve your goals, right? Think, I mean, because we spend so much time talking about habits and processes. And those are, the, those are the things that make your goals achievable and easier too, right? Like it gets... Because before joining this group, the thought of, listing 10 a day was like wow that's a lot now that doesn't seem like much it's all a lot of a lot of habits <clears throat> let's see Kar karima the uh, we're we're talking about atomic habits by james clear put in the chat again and um, to go to just to reinforce what Dana said, and I agree, like, I, I think our group is an example. So which of those three do you think our group falls into the close, the many or the powerful? I think there's different elements of all of them. Yeah, I was going to say when you were talking about how we adapt to the group and a, a chimpanzee will change behavior when introduced to a different group because the group is so complex and we have tech who knows eBay and knows procedures and best practices because of his experience. We, he also brings in Chris who has a different perspective. We also have people in different areas and we learn from each other. So not only are we one of those groups that's that come, where the power comes down and trickles down with the right information, but we are also, uh, powerful like a tree because we also take information from the ground and from everybody's experience and we disseminate it up Ooh, I like that. I love that. that's that's what i found that it's kind of amazing if you think about it there's a lot of groups and there's a lot of way of saying that like uh what are we somebody was laughing and saying that is like a cult and it's not like a cult in a cult the information only comes from the top to down everybody else is wrong the boss is always correct our group has the topper on the tree, but it also sucks the sap from the ground and information travels up, which makes it incredibly unique, I think. And then you have the layer of those who are similar because at the end of the day, we will adopt an idea from people who we feel are most like us. So we have the 24 seven room, we have people where we communicate and we have more close relationships. So I think the group in a weird way covers all three of them. Yeah. The many, the powerful and the few and the ones that are super close. Yeah. Well, and talking about power, like I don't, I think it was Chris that was talking about how, like when you're searching eBay now, you can tell who's in the group and who isn't based on their photos, based on their listings, based on keywords, everything. And what I've been checking comps, I'm like, oh, that person's in the group. <laughs> and I mean, we're gonna be the top of the top people. 
yeah, the, the, the group is kind of re reshaping the landscape of eBay. Like I, yeah, I wonder that, that the top 10%, like in the eBay quality listing report that, that tech says we want to compare ourselves to, I bet 90% of that at this point, I'd, I'd like to know the percentage of that top 10% that comes from our group. I bet it's the majority. And I'd hate to be, and what's fun is like, well, we've talked about the price, like was it $35 a month, basically a dollar a day. And I, and I have some reseller friends that they just have this philosophy that maybe they've been burned by other people that paying for a group is bad. I'm like, oh, number one, <laughs> I mean, number one, it's an expense you can write off. Um, and, and not to mention just all the, you get the practical knowledge, you get all the groups. It seems like we're getting new groups all the time. We're, it, it's almost like if you think about like a university or, or college class, like you got your fundamentals and then you got your upper, maybe graduate school or your up, upper level classes where that content is being specialized, whether it's the shoe call or media call or, um, accounting what, what whatever i mean even this group in a way even though we we talk more big ideas in here it's not like it's practical i think it's kind of seeing the big picture and uh, i don't know um i'm rambling again but yeah i love that metaphor dana the the tree because tech sets the tone but like this group it's almost like it's taken a life of its own and and i'll go back to the point that that James Clear made, you know, once you hit your goal, it's important to stay in that group because, because of the, the support, right? Like if you take it, like going with Dana's metaphor of the tree, if the group is the tree or it's like, like the tree is nourished from the nutrients in the soil. And so if you, if, if each of us was a tree and maybe we're an orchard, right? Like a bunch of trees. So if you, if you moved your tree out of the group, then it, it's lost all the nutrients and, and that, that it needs to thrive. Uh, I don't know. I might be out there. I used to teach English, so I like that. I love the metaphor. Actually, it is so, so funny that you actually brought that up because <laughs> it dawned on me that when, uh, when I started gaining weight, see, when I lost weight, I was in a there's this app where you track your calories and you are part of groups. It's called my fitness belt. Yep. I've been on it for years and years and years for like seven years running the same group. And once I started, uh, I stopped smoking and I started eating more and I was not doing so good. I left. And when you said that leaving the group, I was like, Oh my God, like everything has to be forever. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I've gained some weight this year. Like at the beginning of the year, I lost a lot of weight. I was doing Bulletproof, the, the Rams, not the Rams, um, Dave Asprey. And it works for me. And I was also using my fitness pal and I would weigh myself every morning and I would record it. And it's almost like our group where you're talking about timing yourself, right? Or the accountability sheet. It's the same thing with, with the weight. Like when I don't weigh myself and input that daily, and if I come back a couple of weeks later, I'm always up. But if I weigh myself and input it daily, it's being conscious of that. It's almost like in your subconscious. I think it influences my behavior through the day. And I think this group is the same way in a lot of different ways. Like if you're not filling out your, you know, that's the only reason I keep posting my stupid clicker because I, I think it's stupid. Well, not stupid. I feel kind of foolish doing it, but it's more of the, it's my accountability. And even if I miss it, I still need to post it. So I have to own that, you know? So, yeah. Yep. So that's, that's kind of like this book brought me like full circle. Like, I really want to say that I really appreciate this and I appreciate the group for having this. I feel like I just stopped in at the right time, you know, to catch this book full circle, to actually learn that you are not more powerful than your habits. You have the power to make new habits, to break the bad ones, but you are never going to rise above your habits. At the end of the day, what you do defines you. And even if it's silly and even if it's simplistic or, or weird, you need them 
and you, once you have them, you better hold on to the good ones. Yeah, I think I think 100% agree. All right, anybody else got any thoughts on, on this chapter? Let's see, next week looks like chapter 10. And I know this page seems really slow, but I just think this book is so powerful that this is probably the one book it's worth going chapter by chapter. Next week, it's chapter 10. I know a lot of people are asking about the book. It's Atomic Habits. Next week, chapter 10, how to find and fix the causes of your bad habits. So that should be good. Um, so, so everybody try to read that. Any questions that you might have or thoughts, jot them down and, and bring them to the group. Any, especially any amazing metaphors you might have like trees. Uh, I love that. <laughs> All right, any final thoughts, guys? All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Let's uh, let's keep working to improve those positive habits and eliminating our negative habits. And we'll see you 